They printed $9 trillion globally. Yeah. And now all of a sudden they're turning off all the taps and pretending they weren't the cause of this problem. And some of the Fed officials sold near the top. That's a different story. They don't know, though. that's actually just a system it, reinforcing a system. They don't know. So remember that what people said at that time, it's not going to create inflation. No, no problem. We got this under control. So inflation is going to be transitory. From what, and they've never sat in a risk chair. They've never built a business. They're making up models that are useless in the real world, completely useless in the real world, trying to understand human action, what people do with their model that makes no sense in the real world. And it then they breaks. get the Nobel Prize. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, they can't say it any other way, but like this is absolute clown world central yeah. where they go around patting each other on the back. Great job, Ben. Great job. You were the original helicopter Ben. You made this policy and now we're giving you the Nobel Prize? Yeah. I'm not saying this, but there's a guy named Cuppy who's a great follow, a hedge fund guy. I know who he is, friend of Mark Moss's. All right, I don't want to dox him too badly. He said, Powell, or sorry, Bernanke should be in prison. I'm not saying that. I am saying that. I will vouch for the same thing. This is criminal behavior that is disgraceful for my children. He said, Powell, or sorry, Bernanke should be in prison. Like, I'm not saying that. I am saying that. I will vouch for the same thing. This is criminal behavior that is disgraceful for my children. But you just carry that on. In my book, I talked about the two years of Powell, or sorry, Bernanke quotes that said, right. leading up to 2008, that said, no problem, there's never yep. been, there's never subprime been, the, well subprime contained. contained, there's never been a reduction in housing prices, there, the economy is strong, over and over as he carried on pol policies that then, and then he gets a Nobel Prize for bailing out the system that, create, that he created. Senator Cynthia Lummis on my podcast recently said that when she was in the House, Ben Bernanke was asked at a public hearing, at what point is our debt unsustainable? And his quote was, I don't know, but we're not there yet. And then she's heard subsequent Fed chairs say that. And it's at what point does the music stop playing? And that, I guess, begs the question. I'm curious your thoughts. We seem to have kicked the can down the road and during times when people thought, no, this is the last one. This is the last QE. Yeah. We're not gonna be able to do it anymore. What's the scenario in which we do muddle through this? So today, if the entire world says is going to stay on the US reserve currency, if the entire, then what that means is US could continue, essentially the, the rest of the world is financing the US and the US, essentially giving vendor financing to the US and US prints that prints money to trade and, and printed money. And that is a negative externality around the world. And if that keeps going and, it, and, you, and other countries are going to trade their hard assets for paper that's going to be devalued over time, forever like oil uh, for, like oil so i'm going to trade my the things that are valuable, valuable in my country in round, yeah. and i'm going to trade my labor in my other country for paper that's worth depreciating value for eternity then this could go on for a long time because it means the rest of the world's pain is the us's gain but you i wouldn't bet on that i wouldn't bet on the rest Again, of the risk world will happen you know, faster yeah. <laughs> but let's do the math for the whole world everyone says how long can it go for the us okay i agree it can go more for the us but it's the periphery nations that will fall down once because again if you take the world as one system the total debt of the world is 400 trillion versus gdp which is 100 trillion if you look at the whole world all right it's very simple there will be catastrophes because of that math of the whole world. Can the USA still do it? Most likely, they will be the last. They're the best looking horse at the glue factory, but that's all they are, the best looking horse at the glue factory. But what ends up happening is now, so the 40s were like this, but the US was the only superpower, and they were in China's position as a manufacturer of the world in, in that at that time. Today, today, they're very different for, if you added today, information travels faster right so learning happens faster so people are more aware of a problem like this there's more superpowers and there's more, there's nine nuclear nations today and growing which is different than the 40s so you could in, in 40s you can and they could impose financial repression on their citizens and their citizens didn't have a way out Today, you can't, with Bitcoin, you can't impose financial repression. People have a way out of the system. And so just that alone, as people understand that, wait, 
I could play in the system and I could make it stronger, or I could just choose and not have financial repression. I could choose a different system. That's a big deal. And then as other nations understand, wait, I can attract those people, and those people have money and economy, and we can build a new economy. It creates a game theory that other nations are going to accept this. So again, this is just a long way of saying that on both events, Bitcoin, uh, on both, it, it, it transitions this system into something new. On one of the panels that we listened to at Bitcoin Amsterdam, they were talking about the idea of the central bank that does adopt Bitcoin will have an advantage. So in terms of the G7 countries, which one do you think will likely embrace Bitcoin because it would give a country like the United States a huge advantage? So I actually suspect that the United States will embrace this earlier, although may maybe not as publicly as a central bank doing it, but through the free market, because it's already happening in Texas and in Florida and in Wyoming, it's already happening and there's tons of business building onto the mining business works. There's a lot of countries in Kenya, the amount of mining activity that's moving into there to chase cheap, cheap energy. So this is happening around the world, but if you, we've talked about, could it be Canada? We'd like it to be Canada, but I suspect but we, it isn't But Canada. we don't have a Jason Lowry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so here's a shout out for my buddy, Jason Lowry, who He's works for the Space Force, US Space Force. Probably the only guy that is in the same league as Michael Saylor that I've met in the intelligence, intelligence in terms of brain intelligence. I've been lucky enough to become friendly with him. I met him in Boston and he's confided in me some of the things that he's working on, which is amazing. Like, you're lucky. The United States is a great country, all right? The reason it's not gonna happen in Canada is because we just don't have the freedom anymore that the USA has. At least you guys have a constitution where freedom of speech is the First Amendment, right? And that's what you need, and that's Bitcoin. And the two things, in my opinion, dovetail nicely. But that being said, the USA is the bastion of capitalism still in the world. They know the risk. There's enough you, smart you, people. That... UK, UK, with what the UK is going through right now, UK could move to this faster just because of Fair. what they're going through. I would, yeah. I would agree with that. But it won't. unfortunately, it won't be Canada because we just don't have the global heft what we do have are people like Jeff that are trying to educate. Luckily, we meet great people in, at meetups like this in Amsterdam that, that take little pieces home. Once it happens though, it'll be a game of, it'll be game theory. Just look at what's happening in, in Central America with El Salvador. numbers are so exciting. If El Salvador had equity, they don't, but if they did, I'd be a huge buyer of the equity of El Salvador. But strangely enough, Jeff and I talked in the past about buying the bonds of El Salvador, it, effectively the equity of El Salvador. We would have loved to have bought those bonds and know that we would get 100 cents on the dollar back, but then Bukele came in and scooped up a bunch of bonds. Brilliant financial risk management in the face of a world they had their GDP grow at 10% on a $28 billion economy. That's not bad. That's 2.8 billion for the good guys. What do you hear in the press? Oh, they lost $50 million yeah. on their Bitcoin position. Excuse me. You lost 50 million, but you just put 2.8 billion yeah. on your top line revenues. And it's unrealized, right? They haven't sold their Bitcoin. They're holding on to it like that. That was the plan. Still so an that opportunity cost. But that being said, Nat, you got to understand, right? It's an order of magnitude higher. For sure. That, that's actually two or you said it the other day. Is it two orders or one order? I mean, it doesn't matter. The point is you're dealing with 2.8 billion yeah. versus 50 million. And what does the New York Times and Krugman report on? And CNBC also, yeah. Really just, disgraceful. Their bet is it paying off. Failed experiment. Reporting. Yeah. Start telling the truth, okay? So people in Central America are going to adopt it. And if we're not smart in Canada, you know what my advice is? Learn Spanish. But it does speak <laughs> to that idea of companies that are adopting Bitcoin as well, mm -hmm. institutions. They are sitting on losses right now, including MicroStrategy, right? That are unrealized, but that goes to speak to the importance of the fair accounting mm -hmm. change that just happened. Can you share for people that are, maybe aren't as familiar, how big of a deal is this for Bitcoin? What happened in the past is you had to write down as a loss you're holding on Bitcoin. And you never got to write it up, you only could write it down, okay? The, if in a case of a company like MicroStrategy where Michael Saylor says he's gonna hold it forever, yeah. it's actually irrelevant because you don't, you're never gonna crystallize your loss unless you sell it. But for new companies that have to report to shareholders that they're putting this risky 
in their terms, risky asset on the books. What if your quarter is destroyed because you have to mark down the holding of a Bitcoin, which is a long-term asset marked to short term? Let's look at, be honest, the banks are exactly the opposite of that. The banks never mark down their holdings unless there's a default on the loans. If it hasn't defaulted, they keep it at 100 cents on the dollar. So I think it was it's fairer, more fair accounting. I think it'll make it easier for other companies yeah, so to come Mike, in. Yeah, Michael Saylor could buy Bitcoin because he owned enough That's of correct. Share, he owned share the board. Bots. He owned like, the board. He, he, could, he, could, board. he could drive the control of that because he had control over the public company. In most cases, that type of rule would prevent a CEO from making that decision because they would be out if Bitcoin went down. That next quarter, they're gone. They flush their um, quarter. They flush their, their quarter, and it, it's an unrealized loss, and it makes no difference to shareholders. But if the accounting says you have to write it down, you have to write so it down. So it'll make it easier, so definitely so, easier. Yeah, so yeah, you, could, you, you could expect a whole bunch more adoption by companies out of that, that rule because it makes it easier to adopt it.